Good evening, welcome to Our Lady of Fatima again as we continue our journey through this season of Lent and as we continue studying uh, the Gospel of St. John. So before Father starts his le lecture, I just want to remind you that next week uh, the lecture is going to be on Tuesday is instead of Wednesday. It's going to be at 7 p.m., but it's going to be on Tuesday. That way, it gives you the chance to go and party for, uh, for St. Patrick's Day. Actually, you shouldn't be partying yet, so just party by yourself at home, okay? So before we start, before we start, let us stand. And today we continue this beautiful season of Lent in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Heavenly Father, as we gather today, we give you thanks for the many blessings you have given us. In a very special way, we thank you for this beautiful and holy season of Lent. We thank you for giving us this time where we can uh, stop a little bit, where we can uh, take some time to reflect about our lives and about our relationship with you. As we continue our journey to Easter, we ask you that you may touch each one of our hearts in a very special way so that we may truly feel your presence in our lives and we may be a worthy offering for you. We ask you that you may give your Holy Spirit of wisdom and your Holy Spirit of um, eloquence uh, to Father Hartin as he continues sharing with us about your word, about your Bible. Bless him and bless each one of us today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Father Hartley. And thank you, Father Miguel, for organizing all of this and the time that you and Aaron spend putting everything together. We really appreciate it. And again, thank you all for joining us again this evening. It's our third session. And when you think back to last year when we started this series, we only managed to accomplish two evenings. So we have now hit the jackpot with three. And thank you also for uh, using this time as your penance during Lent. I think it's a wonderful way of uh, experiencing, you know, being together and reflecting together on the sacred scriptures. And what struck me was so nicely was that just before our session began, we had the Stations of the Cross, and Lent is all about journeying towards the death and resurrection of Jesus. And when we think about the scriptures, again, their focus is on Jesus and ultimately culminating in his death and resurrection. So tonight, I wish to talk about the topic of edited, the portrayal of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And once again, I remind you that we see John's Gospel as the spiritual Gospel. And what I'm trying to um, focus on in that is that we have an idea of Jesus that the Gospel of John presents us with. And then the Gospel of Jesus is trying to show how people interact with this person, Jesus, how they respond to him. And they become symbols for us in the ways in which Jesus is also re uh, reaching out to us on our journey, striving to draw us closer to him. So the starting point is our understanding of who Jesus is, and that gives the very basis for everything. Just to compare it or contrast it with, shall we say, the Gospel of Mark, Mark strives to present the picture of Jesus as the Messiah who's come to suffer for people. It's through his suffering that he brings us closer to God, that he restores our relationship with God. And Mark is doing that deliberately because he's writing to people at a time when they are suffering, when they are being persecuted in the course of the, the Roman persecutions. And he's trying to show that Jesus suffered. And so how do we respond to that suffering in our own lives? And so this brings us then to our gospel tonight, 
to try and see the picture that Mark, that John is presenting of who Jesus is and inviting us, and we'll look at that in the next two, two talks, about the response that he's calling forth from us. But first of all, let's get clarity about the idea of Jesus that John is trying to present. Now, I think we should keep in mind that uh, John's Gospel is written, let's put it like this, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke were probably written to what I would call the second generation Christians. The first generation of Christians were Peter and the, and the followers who were with Jesus here on earth. But now that they have, most of them have started to pass away from, from the middle of the 60s onwards, um, we get a new generation has been brought into play, into following Jesus, through the preaching and teaching of the Apostles. And the point of writing these Gospels was to have a record to try and show well, what the preaching of these Apostles was all about. So it all becomes for us an authority for future generations to preserve this message of the Apostles. John's Gospel was probably, I would say, written to a third generation of Christians. People towards the, end, the, the very end of the, of the um, first century, somewhere between 90 and 100 um, AD. And so we, we've got a, a, a later time in which a separation is happening between the, the Jewish people and Christians. Uh, up until this time, as I said last week, we probably still spoke about um, Christian Jews. Uh, you could say that Peter and company were Christian Jews, so were the second generation, but now we have a separation happening, really, between what we would call Judaism and Christianity. And so John is trying to give us, in his writing, a deep, and not just us, but the, the third generation of Christians, a, a, a reflection on who this Jesus is, a deeper reflection on his relationship with the Father, the relationship with the Spirit. Now, obviously, John and those early disciples didn't have the language that later Christians used to explain the relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit. The language, one God, three persons in one God, they, they didn't have that language. So, John is trying to explain it in terms that he can use and that people would understand at that particular time. So that's the background to what we are looking at. So the first point I've made in these notes that I'd like to draw your attention to is that the person of Jesus Christ is here to reveal the Father to us. So that Jesus is the Divine Son. There's no doubt about it. He is God's divine Son, the Father's divine Son, and He's come to make the Father known to us. I've used this phrase many times before, but Pope Benedict had a beautiful phrase to refer to Jesus. He is the human face of God, that we can understand who God is through the person Jesus Christ. Why? Because He is the divine Son. So the first term that John uses at the very beginning of his Gospel to try to capture uh, the relationship between the Son and the Father is the term Word. The Word became flesh. We spoke about that last week when we took a survey through the entire Gospel of John, and we noticed that that's the very way in which John begins his Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he later on says, and the Word became flesh. The Word became a human being, as it were. So what does this term Word really mean? Where does John get it? Because you don't find it in any of the other Gospels. There's only one other place where the, Jesus is referred to as the Word, and that is in the first letter of John. So another writing that comes from John. So let's talk a little bit about the meaning, the, the idea of this concept of word. Well, first of all, I think the way of understanding it is to look at the way John is using a term that 
ultimately comes from the Greek world. The Greeks uh, had the term Logos, and Philo, who was uh, a Jewish scholar in Alexandria, one of the uh, famous, uh, you know, early, uh, people who lived around the same time as Jesus, he used this term Logos to talk about in, in reference to God. And it's that same term that John takes over as well. But it was also a term that the philosophers of the time of John used, the Stoic philosophers. And it was a term that they used to refer to the reason, uh, Logos was the, the reason behind the structure and order of the universe in which we live. That, the, that there is an order to the universe. There are laws and rules of that, and that, that, that reason is dominated by what, he, what the Greeks called Logos. The term Logos was also used in, by the Stoics to refer to the creative power that had structured the world order out of chaos. So it's rather beautiful to think that a term that the Stoic philosophers were using at the time of John is a term that captured an essence, an understanding of what John himself is trying to con uh, 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 hand on to us with regard to who Jesus is. So the reason, the, the, the logic, the, the order, the structure of the world in which we live. And as we said last week when we quoted that hymn, it, the creation of our world, according to John, happened how? Through the Word. The Word is, it is the one that, is, that formed the, the, everything that happens, the structure of our world, it's, it's ordered according to a certain reason and so forth. And John sees this term logos that the Stoics use as a beautiful way of trying to explain who Jesus is. The order that the world is structured around. Jesus is the one, or the, the Word, the Son of God, is the one that brought it about. But then John also, again, it shows the depth of his thought in trying to reflect upon Jesus. He also goes back to the world of the Old Testament, his sacred scriptures, and he quotes, uh, he goes back to thoughts that are found in a couple of writings that are not found in the Jewish Bible of today, but were very popular in the Jewish world in Greek, largely outside of Palestine. And these are writings that became part and parcel of our Catholic scriptures. Other Christians don't accept them. But these are some beautiful writings. And we have a writing called the Book of Sirach. And it's just simply wisdom teaching, a wisdom that a father would hand on to his children, instructing them that this is the way in which you should be leading your lives, eh? because it's a great way of passing on statements, sayings, thoughts, and ideas that would be important for a future generation uh, after the, the parents have, have passed away. And in the book of Sirach, in chapter 24, we have a couple of phrases or statements that I think are significant. And what Sirach is talking about here is he's talking about a wisdom, Sophia, that, that he presents as a personification of God's creative power, as it were. And in talking about this wisdom, this is the way he explains it. The Creator, this is in chapter 4, 24, verse 8 of the book of Sirach, he says, The creator of all things commanded me, referring to wisdom, and the one who created me gave me, gave my tent a resting place. And he said, Make your dwelling in Jacob, and in Israel receive your inheritance. From eternity, in the beginning, God created me. And for eternity, I shall not cease to be. Doesn't that remind you exactly of what John is talking about? The Word became flesh. The, the, um, the way in which the literal sense of what John is saying is 
the word pitched his tent among us. And that's what we're translating as the word became flesh. The word pitched his tent among us. That's what this is, this passage is talking about. The wisdom pitched its tent among us. So you've got the Old Testament pointing to some uh, understanding, a sort of personification of wisdom. And what John is saying is not just a personification. It is truly the Word, the, the, the person that we are talking about, the Son of God, as it were. So what John has done so beautifully is, is to harmonize thoughts coming from the Greek world, thoughts coming from the Hebrew world, in order to try to explain, in as best way he could, who Jesus is in his relationship with God. So Jesus, the Word is God. The Word was with God from the very beginning. The Word is the one that, was took, that, that brought into existence the creation that we have, and the Word pitches his tent among us, comes to dwell among us. Isn't that a beautiful way, a, a vision that he's trying to present to us of the relationship between the Word, pitching his tent, to become this, this Jesus Christ, and we see him as the Son of God. So it's, it really is a, a deep reflection that he's, he is undertaking in trying to explain things for us, the readers, as well as the people of his own time. That's my first point. The second point I'd like to say about the way John explains who Jesus is, or tries to present him, is that he takes another term from the Old Testament and uses it to apply to Jesus in a way that identifies Jesus fully as the Son of God, identifies him as God. Now, first of all, I guess you one could, should also emphasize is that no way did the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, present Jesus in these terms. They tried to present Jesus from the perspective of the disciples in the way in which they struggled to make sense of who Jesus is. It took them a long time before they really understood or believe that Jesus is the, the Christ, the Messiah, the one who'd been promised to come that fulfilled all the hopes of the Old Testament. Mark's Gospel is so, so beautiful on this, this score because the disciples really struggle. They're pretty dense. You know, Jesus tells them three times he's going to suffer and die and then rise from the dead. But they, they fail to understand that. It's only through the power of the resurrection afterwards that they come to appreciate exactly who Jesus Christ is. But Mark wants to show us, and as the other Gospels did, do, is that it wasn't easy for them to come to this point of accepting Jesus as uh, the, the Son of God, shall we say. Because after all, they're Jewish. There's only one God, and they're trying to understand you know, how Jesus can perform these miracles and so forth. But, but for John's Gospel, he's moved past all of that. Eh? Because now we're in the third, the third generation. We know who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. He is, what we call him, the Word made flesh. And so he's, he's not giving us a picture of, historically, shall we say, how the Apostles struggled to come to that point. We believe that now. And he's trying to explain in more detail for us who Jesus is, this person, Jesus Christ, the Word, and his relationship with God. And so he has, a, as we, we hear him, as I've just mentioned, with identifying Jesus as the Word, as with God, and the Word was God, and, and so he went on. Now he has a second way in which Jesus speaks that is also pretty powerful showing us so clearly that Jesus is God, or that he is, um, and he, Jesus speaks in the ways in which God spoke in the Old Testament. If you look at chapter 3 of the book of Exodus, we have God 
revealing himself to Moses and to the Israelites as regards who this God of Israel is. And this chapter 3 is that famous story of the burning bush where Moses has um, been brought up in the, in the court of Pharaoh and as such he's been educated as an Egyptian would have been educated. But then Moses killed an Egyptian and as a result of that he had to, he had to flee from Egypt and he went into the desert of Sinai. And then Moses sees this amazing event, a bush that's burning. It doesn't seem to be burning and being destroyed, it's just burning. So he's curious, and he goes along there to see what's going on. And then he has an encounter with God in the burning bush. And if I read um, uh, what, uh, from chapter 3, where Moses says, I'll turn aside to see this great sight, why this bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Then he said, do, do not come near. Take the sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And Moses said, Oh no, and God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land. A land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But... Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you when you have been brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. But then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And so the story goes on. But Moses doesn't want to do what God is asking. He objects four times. He always finds four different objections why he can't do it, and God answers all of them. But the starting point is, well, it's logical. If I go to the people of Israel and say, you sent me, but who are you? Because a person's name is so significant in that culture, because it tells you something about the person. He says, I am who I am. Now that's a rather strange, enigmatic statement, shall we say. But it's, the, it's a translation of the word Yahweh. And that is the, uh, the word, the name of God, Yahweh, which the Jewish people never said. They never said it aloud simply because they respected God's name so much. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Right? And so the, tra the translation that we have here, I am who I am, it's a way of trying to put in words the meaning of this term, Yahweh. One way in which I, got, I, I like the explanation, it's more along these lines, where God is saying, you will discover who I am by what I do for you. Remember, the people of Israel and the Jewish people were never philosophers. You know, the Greeks produced the philosophers of Plato and 
Aristotle and Socrates and so forth, the Jews had no philosophers. It's just, they were a concrete people. They, they, they spoke in concrete terms. And so if you wanted to say what Moses was saying is, look, I'm not giving you, or God is not saying, I'm giving you an ontological explanation of who I am that the Greeks would want. But he's saying, look, God's saying, look, you'll discover who I am by what I do for you. And how is it that we come to understand anybody? It's through our interactions with people that we come to understand who the person is. So this, this phrase, I am who I am, or you'll discover who I am by what I do for you, is a term, a technical term that's used for God throughout the whole of the Old Testament. <coughs> now when we come to the New Testament, when Jesus, Jesus uses that term, I am, to refer to himself. And in doing that, he's identifying himself with God. God of the Old Testament, as it were. Just to show you this in, in, a, in a very um, very clear way, if you turn over the page to the, the, the slide number seven, you can see what he's doing. And we tend to jump over this or not, not pay attention to it, but it's really, really significant. In John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus says to them, Very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. So, again, he's, he's giving us the, uh, the understanding that obviously Jesus has existed, or when I say Jesus, I mean the Word, the Son of God, has existed before Abraham. But when he says, I am, he's talking about the I am of the Old Testament. God. In John 6, 60, verse, 6, verse 20, Jesus says to the disciples, I am. Do not be afraid. Here's the, but if you don't believe me in all of this, and you think I'm reading something into it, look at the next two statements. It's as clear as water. In chapter 18, verse 4 to 5, that's when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the soldiers are looking for Jesus. And Jesus asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus replied, I am. And then the next verse explains it more fully. When Jesus said to them, I am, they stepped back and fell to the ground. What happened? Why do they fall to the ground? Well, in the presence of the divinity, that's what, you, that's what happens. It's, it's an act of worship almost. So the soldiers then are struck, amazed with what has happened here. Now some translations, or some translations in their brilliant wisdom, translate these terms like, I am he. Who are you looking at Jesus? I am he. That's what we say in English. But no, that's not what it's talking about. I am he distorts the whole thing. It's I am. So he used, with, the, with the, 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 the deliberateness of an attempt to show exactly who Jesus is. He's identifying himself with God. You shouldn't be surprised, because that's what John said right at the very beginning of his Gospel. And then I could, there are other examples, just to, if you're not convinced of that, look at a few other examples. Jesus, there are seven sayings that Jesus uses, which we hear many, most so often, eh? where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the real vine. All of these are, are images that Jesus is using Again, in doing so, he's explaining the, the, the role that he as God is performing. The resurrection and the life. Who else can give the resurrection and life except the Word? The bread of life. The bread of life that we celebrate every time we, we celebrate the Eucharist. 
and so one could go on. But John only gives us seven. He plays with numbers quite a lot too. And one of the, the reasons for number seven, seven is the perfect number, the complete number. There are seven days in a week. A week is complete, seven days. They're not eight days, they're seven days. So seven in the Jewish world brings about the idea of completeness. So here, through these seven images, or analogies, shall we say, we get a feel for who Jesus is. And he, he, it gives you a complete insight into him. So the point I'm trying to make in all of this is that John, in the way in which Jesus talks, Jesus doesn't talk this way in the Synoptic Gospels. In the Gospel, you never hear Jesus saying, I am in any form whatsoever. But John is the one who does it because John has come to the insight through God's Spirit for the clear understanding that Jesus truly is the Son of God. And he's showing Jesus is this right from the very beginning. And the disciples have no hesitation in acknowledging that Jesus is this. And so by doing so, John is wanting his readers, and that's us as well, if this is who truly who Jesus is, the Word made flesh, the Son of God, well, we have to make a choice, a decision for him. Do we accept that or don't we? And you can see in all of the encounters how often it's either people do accept it or otherwise people back off, especially like the Pharisees and Sadducees in, in that term. So John, John has, just to go on with the, another feature that is, again, so significant in this Gospel, is that he has... Um, terms for, for Jesus, uh, that, uh, or, or titles, that's the best word, titles for Jesus, that you don't find in the other Gospels. I drew attention to this, this before, but the word obviously is the one that you don't find in the others. The term, the Lamb of God, those ter that term is not used in the other Gospels. John uses it deliberately. John the Baptist is the one who identifies Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That phrase has become immortalized in our Catholic Church. Because that's what we say when we hold up the, the, the host, the sacred body of Christ. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist identifies Jesus right from the very beginning. And what does that mean? The Lamb of God who takes... It's a, it's a reference to the lamb that was slaughtered, particularly on Passover, when the, Jew, the Jewish people on the, the day before, the afternoon before Passover, they slaughtered the, this lamb. And that lamb was, was used as, a, you know, in their meal that they are celebrating, but that, that lamb is, is uh, offered to God for the salvation of the people. It's reminding them of how God saved them from destruction when they were in Egypt before the people, uh, the, the Egyptians finally relented to let the Jewish people leave, the Hebrew people leave. And so John is, is identified. This is who Jesus is. He is going to be slaughtered just as the lamb is slaughtered at Passover. Here's another that's an interesting point taken up from that. If you look at the, the, the slide number 11, here is something that sometimes mystifies people. And I remember it was, uh, it was a Clyde, yes. Clyde raised that question uh, two weeks ago, really, in which he asked, how do you reconcile these... Um, uh, inconsistencies in the in the in the in the Bible or in the Gospel. Here's one major major inconsistency that not too many people pay attention to. But let's look at it more carefully. When we talk about the celebration of the Feast of Passover and Jesus' death, now in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus celebrates a Passover meal, doesn't he, with his disciples at the Last Supper. And then after celebrating that Passover meal, 
Then he goes off and he, said, and he experiences a rest and he's put to death. So that's, if you look at the, um, the first column there where I've got Matthew, Mark and Luke, Thursday evening we would identify, well, Jesus is celebrating Thursday evening the Passover meal with his disciples. And then, you know, Friday, Jesus is put on the cross, he's arrested, he's condemned to death, he um, dies on that Friday, uh, and then on the Saturday evening, Jesus is in the tomb, and he, he's there for three days, or shall we say, uh, as they calculate it, uh, and then he rises on the Sunday. But look at the way John tells the story. He says it very differently. In the Gospel of John, the Thursday when Matthew, Mark and Luke have Jesus celebrating the Passover, John talks about, this is the, he calls it the, the presentation or the preparation day. They're preparing for the Passover feast. They're preparing for it. And then on the Friday, the feast of Passover, when Jesus dies on that cross, Jesus dies at the same time that all the lambs are being slaughtered in the temple. The reason why John is doing that is because he wants us to see Jesus as replacing the sacrifice of the lambs because he is now the true lamb that has been, that has been put to death. And then obviously Jesus then is put into the tomb on that Friday evening and um, he, he remains there until the Sunday. So do you see the little difference? In the, God, in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus celebrates a Passover meal. Huh? In John's Gospel, the Passover is actually going to be celebrated the next day. Why? Because that's the day that Jesus is put to death, just as the Passover lamb was, uh, was killed at that time. Now, again, the Gospels are not trying to teach us history. What John is trying to do is always to try and explain things or tell the story in which a significance, the meaning of things is important for John. And that's why you get that discrepancy. It's not, it's from our point of view, whereby historical perspectives are so important, huh? and otherwise then we say, well, that's not true or whatever. But John is not interested in the... Um, the actual event doesn't matter when Jesus actually, whether it was a Passover or not. No, it doesn't matter from John's point of view because he wants to show the real significance that Jesus is fulfilling what John the Baptist said right at the very beginning, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's the culmination point. It doesn't upset me. Hopefully it doesn't upset you. So, where are we with time? How are we going? So, one final, okay, so that, that's the way in which uh, uh, Jesus is presented. You know, I'm just trying to identify. Obviously, there are many other dimensions to Jesus that one could talk about, which are very similar to the Synoptic Gospels. Obviously, everything is not different, but these are the main striking differences. So, if that is who Jesus is, the Word identified with God, how do we respond to that? There's a much more awesome response that is called for. One final thought about the Gospel of John, which is worth noting, and that is, John gives us very clearly what his aim is. He says it in such a clear way. At the end of chapter 20, remember there are 21 chapters, but at the end of chapter 20, John says this. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing in him you will have eternal life. So what does he try to do right throughout his gospel? He's trying to show us that Jesus is the Son of God. 
And it's only by believing in Jesus Christ that we can have life eternal. And for John, eternal life means it's something that happens right now. When we are baptized, when we come to believe in Jesus and, get, and are baptized, we receive life eternal, eternal life, which is exactly that. It's a life that never ends. It's a life that goes, passes through death into the, the life of God. Okay? So often when we talk about eternal life, we think about heaven. John says, nonsense. It begins now. This, this is, eternal life is here. That's what you experience. It's, it's going, because why? Life doesn't end. Life just, but death is just a passageway to the future. Isn't that such a beautiful idea? You and I have eternal life. Nothing to worry about. All we have to do is lead our lives in response to what Jesus has done for us. It's such a consoling, beautiful thought. We make such a big deal about dying. But John just says, don't worry about that. You know, it's just a passageway to a future. And when we come to talk a little bit about Jesus himself on the cross, when he dies, it's exactly that. There's, it's not a horrific event for Jesus. It's a passageway to returning to the Father. I think if we as Christians really took to heart what John says, our lives would be so much more joyful. What does it matter when all these things are happening? What does it matter having to go through this pandemic? It's just, if I die, so what? My eternal life is going to be something more to be celebrated and enjoyed. So there's, there's a beauty to all of this. Now, I'd like to pass on to what I plan to do in the next talk, and that is looking at how we are called to respond to this, who Jesus is. As the Word, the Son of God, how do we respond to Him? And what John does is he gives us a number of examples. Too many to be to, for us to deal with. But I, I want to look at the first ones, the first examples. Because, uh, you know, that they are obviously the first disciples. How they respond to Jesus. And uh, if we take a look at uh, the, the um, final page I've given you, it's, uh, I did refer to this very briefly a year last week, but it's the call of the, the first disciples. And you will see once again how John's description of the calling of the first disciples is so different from the calling of Jesus in Matthew, Mark and Luke. When you see what happens in Matthew, Mark and Luke, what happens? Jesus is walking along the, the Sea of Galilee and he sees Peter and, J and Andrew, James and John in a, in, you know, looking after their, their, their nets in the, their boats with their, their, with their father and Jesus calls them, come follow me. And all of the, the four just drop everything and off they go following Jesus. Huh? Well, that's the picture that um, Matthew, Mark and Luke give. Look at, look at the way we see it here in the Gospel of John. And this is in the very first chapter. The very first chapter. John says in chapter 1, verse 20, 35. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist. With two of his disciples. So John has his own followers. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. So they're inquisitive. Who is this? They run after Jesus. Two of them. Jesus turned, saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where Jesus was staying. And they stayed him with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. 
One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew. He doesn't tell us who the other disciple was, but one of them was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah. Notice, he had, they, no problem, we know that he is the Messiah, no doubt about it, which means Christ. So he brought Peter, or Simon, to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You'll be called Cephas, which means Peter. So that's so different. Eh? Jesus calls Andrew. Andrew calls Peter and brings him to Jesus. Eh? Isn't that beautiful? It's, it's exactly the way in which discipleship should be. If we truly understand who Jesus is, what do we want to do? We want to bring others who are close to us, our closest people, to really accept and understand Jesus as well. He is the Messiah. He's the fulfillment of the whole Old Testament. That's what Andrew is the one who's understood that. Now, I have a big uh, apology to make, and as that apology is to Joan, Joan Leeds. Uh, it was exactly two months ago, Joan sent me an email with a question. A question on behalf of the RCIA people who are uh, preparing to join the church. And they were reading this passage was, I think it's a second uh, Sunday of ordinary time. And they were reading this and they wanted to know, and Joan wants to know, the reference to this. Uh, now if we come back to verse 39 where Jesus says, come and you will see. So they came and saw where Jesus was staying. And they stayed with Jesus that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Now notice in the Greek, this is the translation I'm giving you here. There is the trans is the words that is that are in the Greek text. It was about the tenth hour. Our brilliant uh, lectionary or translation that we have at Mass tells us that it is the fourth hour. It is it's four p.m. That's what it says. It's four p.m. Four o'clock in the afternoon. Well, both of them are right. But Joan wants to know, well, why is it four o'clock in the afternoon? What's, what's the point of that? Well, to, if I go back to when John says it is the tenth hour, John, when he, he is using the way in which the Romans calculated the time of day, they calculated it, well, from, well, there are two ways of calculating. One of the ways was from midnight to midnight. That's one of the ways. So at night time, they would talk about uh, different four watches in, of the evening. But in the daytime, it's obviously, the, it's a slumber or somewhere different. Sunrise to, to sunset, that's the day. And they divided up the day into 12 hours. And in doing so, obviously the 10th hour would be four o'clock in the afternoon. The AM and PM that we use here in the United States, ante meridium and post meridium, that's the way in which the Romans calculated their day. Before noon, afternoon, or by the number of hours. Uh, for 10 hours, 12 hours would be sunset. That's the way they would be looking at it. Uh, so the reason why uh, John is saying, well, it's, it's Ten, and it's the 10th hour or 4 p.m. is just simply when it's late in the day. And that's why they spend the rest of the day and probably not with Jesus. That's all that it's trying to cap capture. I think that's the way it's, it's doing it. Eh? So, I, I, it, it, again, it's showing John's insight into, uh, you know, the, 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 obviously their, their day is, that nobody's got to watch. They've got sundials and so on, which will calculate the time, but that's the, that's the, the way in which they would be looking at things. So, it's, again, I, I just find these as little interesting side points to understand how the, the terminology uses. You'll find, for example, when the, the cock crows uh, in, in John's Gospel, and so they'll talk about a watch, and uh, one of the watches, there are four watches in the night, uh, going from... Uh, sunset to uh, what would it be um, our, our uh, 9 p.m. 
uh, or, or at night, and then to 12 o'clock, and then to 3, and then to, to 6 o'clock, as it were. For, I have a very interesting um, article I got from uh, online about the calculation of the day at the time in the Roman world. If anybody wants a copy, I can always email it to you. I find it fascinating. <laughs> but it's just, um, it's just interesting uh, side points to this. So, but anyway, then I, I digress, and our time is, is very, very valuable. So let's, let's come back to, again, uh, the, the interaction for the first time. Oh, I must tell you this little story. I, I think I've told you this. I've told you this before, but when I was, I think I, I was probably in, uh, I'm trying to think now, probably the uh, uh, sixth grade or something, yeah, probably that's what it was, in, in South Africa, and uh, our teacher gave us a quiz, and one of the questions was, who was the first disciple whom Jesus called? And I wrote, Andrew. And the teacher marked it wrong. And I was mad. She said it was Peter. Well, it depends on which gospel you use, you see. And I think I was a smart aleck or whatever. And I was really mad about it. Of course, I said, I said to my mom afterwards, look, here, Andrew is the first one who was called. Why is it wrong? And my mom said, well, just get over it, Patrick. <laughs> but, but there you have it. So again, you, you, many of these answers come from obviously which way you look at things. <laughs> so the important thing in this, in this that, that John is trying to show us is that Jesus calls someone and that person then calls someone else. Calls Andrew, Andrew calls Peter. Which is, I think, an interesting uh, perspective. And obviously Jesus shows who uh, Peter is the one that's the, the more important than Andrew, really, and will turn out to be. The next pa passage we have of verse 43, the next day, so you can see now we're on to the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now we don't hear about the call of Philip in the other Gospels. And now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> it's like someone in Seattle saying, Can anything good come out of Spokane? <laughs> Philip said to him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered Jesus, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Now notice, at the end of John's Gospel, he says, These things are written so that you will know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Andrew is the first one who calls Jesus the Messiah. He says to Peter, come, we found the Messiah. Here we have with Nathaniel, says when Jesus identifies know, what, that he knows who Nathaniel is, and Nathaniel says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. He makes, he makes that profession of faith. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe you will see greater things than these? And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So you will truly come to see exactly who I am. So right from the beginning, we have the disciples responding to Jesus in the ways in which we are called to respond, with faith. Faith in Jesus that he is the Messiah, the fulfillment of all of the hopes of the people of Israel. But he's also more than that. Huh? He is God's Son, huh? the Word. Huh? So that's right from the very beginning. That is who Jesus is. And that's whom we are invited to, to accept. Huh? And we respond in that particular way. Huh? So you can see the depth of the belief that um, 
John is presenting with regard to Jesus, and he's trying to, um, shall we say, uh, support our belief and try and encourage us, as the disciples did, to go out and welcome others into that relationship. Well, I think that I've spoken for long enough. I'd like to give you an opportunity to ask any questions you might have or any further um, explanations you would want or challenges that you might have. Yes? Why, why did they make that comment that anything good comes from Nazareth? Oh, I, I think it's, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a way of just simply trying to show how people despised or looked down upon Nazareth, how insignificant this place is. And it's from its insignificance what happens. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God has come. So I think so. The people have looked down upon Na Nazareth, but in actual fact, there's nothing to despise. It's something remarkable that is there. And I suppose we could say the same thing as the challenge for all of us. How many times do we look down upon somebody from where they come from? I come from South Africa. Can anything good come from there? <laughs> you might some, you know, this is sometimes people are like that. Huh? Um, well, you know, uh, but but that's that's the basic the, the point I think. Yeah. Yes. Right, yes, that is very, it's excellent, I can endorse what you say, it really is, again, a, a very good um, way of looking at a response to Jesus, and in this instance, how one comes to a deeper appreciation or insight into exactly who Jesus is. It's not just a human person, but there's something far more that is important there. I think someone else had a question. Yes? When Jesus was saying, I am. Yes. No, it would be it would be a form of that. You see, the the let's put it like this: the it's the the way John when John writes, he's writing in Greek, huh? whereas Jesus Jesus is not speaking that way in Hebrew. It's only in Greek, huh? and in Greek it's that it's ego a me is the word is the phrase that John uses. So, I am. And the, when you look at it in that sense, the logical thing would be to say, I am he, but there's no he there. So I'm, I'm emphasizing that it's John's interpretation of Jesus that he's putting on the mouth of Jesus. Uh, if you want to say historically, it, uh, when Jesus was preaching and teaching, I don't think Jesus used that language, uh, because I think the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are closer to what historically is happening. But John is saying, look, I'm like this eagle, I'm flying up there and just reflecting on, on who Jesus is, and he's putting it down in the language of, of the Greeks, as it were. Does that help? 
But I, 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 I'm glad you raised that question because I don't want to think, you to think that John's just making all of this up. Huh? No, it's, I'm not, John is not trying to give us an historical perspective of this is the way things actually happened or these are the actual words that Jesus spoke. But he's, he's presenting us with this is who Jesus is. This is the voice of Jesus. Huh? And this is what we believe in. I want you to, he says at the, at the end, I want you to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Eh? And so he has Jesus speaking and preaching and teaching in the way in which the Son of God would preach. Eh? Yes? I think that makes it rather obvious too that that's probably why the division between the No. no, exactly. That's the biggest stumbling block. Eh? I mean, the Jewish people even today recognize Jesus as a great teacher, but they don't see him as the Son of God, as it were. But that's for us a profession of faith. Eh? So I, 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 I sometimes I, I get concerned because I don't want people to think that John's just making everything up, but he's trying to capture exactly who Jesus is for believers. And this is what we believe. And, this, and the belief of it comes from the experience of reflecting on who Jesus Christ is. Just as Athanasius and company in the second, third centuries or whatever, in the profession of God is, um, you know, one being with three persons. Huh? It's not in the Bible, but again, it captures what the Bible is actually trying to trying to present. Yes. Do we know when the word Trinity was first used? Oh yes, but I, I I can't give you an answer right now. But it would be it's it's obviously you know in the the Greek church the church in the first uh, couple of hundred years in which they I can try and find out for you. Absolutely, I will. Huh? But it's certainly not in the Bible. But just as the, the Bible itself, you know, in, in the word Bible, there's no word for that. It's what we are identifying as such. So there's a lot that, you know, is there that we take and then we sort of recognize, well, that's not really what it, what's there, but it's the foundations are in that sense. Yes. Yes. Was he a very, very old man? Did he have personal knowledge of Jesus? Or was he getting this information second or third chance from those that had been there? Well, I think try and see it along these lines that that John is, is identified as we call him John, but the Bible itself refers refers to him as the beloved disciple, who we understand as John, the son of Zebedee, that's the way we, we see it. But um, you know, that, that he, he was with Jesus. The beloved disciple was sitting around having the meal with Jesus uh, in the Last Supper. And he is the one, the Bible constantly goes out of his way to talk about, he is the one who, who testified to who Jesus is and so forth. So it's his testimony that has been handed on. Eh? And it's been handed on through his preaching and so forth. But I think that it is someone else would put it in writing. And then I didn't end with this, but there is a, an appendix that's given to this, this gospel. And that appendix is chapter 21. And that chapter 21 was written by somebody else talking about this beloved disciple, saying that we know that his testimony is true. So it's, yeah, sure, he was, a, a, I mean, obviously I, we see him as being an old man. It's, it's been a long period of time in which he's been handing on, on this message. Up until, well, I mean, if he was born, shall we say, more or less, almost at the time of, of Jesus, if you like, he would be about 90 years old, which would be extraordinary in that world. Huh? But still, it would be, uh, there's a still a reality to that, yes. Um, the Gnostic heresy, which yes. is the Yes. Is that contemporary with John in a response to that heresy? 
Not specifically. I, it certainly is the, the, it's, it's um, a, a, a vision, a perspective that Jesus is not, is, is not, um, there's no the flesh. I mean, Jesus isn't, he isn't um, material as we are, we, as we would understand our physical body. Because for the Gnostics, the uh, material world is evil. And so, but Jesus is the divine element that's come down to earth to preach and, and teach. Eh? And uh, I think it was clearly there are beginnings of that particular uh, movement, or if you use the word heresy, at the time of John. It was the same thing at the time, the time of the later letters attributed to Paul, eh? but it became much more significant then. Eh? And they, it's a retelling of the story of Jesus as we said last time with these Gnostic scriptures. It's their way of interpreting all these events at a later time in a way to try to support their vision of things. The first letter, I, I can, the first letter of John is very interesting because it seems that there were some members of the community of John and they were interpreting John's gospel in that sort of way, eh? that, the, that uh, Jesus wasn't fully, wasn't human, it's, it's more the divine aspect, eh? and, and, and so on. And the letter of John is, is almost like a covering letter saying, this is the way you must interpret my gospel. And it goes out of its way to emphasize how the, the, the different, how, how this gospel does emphasize the humanity of Jesus as well as the divinity. Because from what I've been saying, you can. You could have taken, gone home and said, well, the Gospel of, of John emphasizes the divinity of Jesus. But what does it say about his humanity? You can get that perspective almost, eh? that Jesus is divine, but what about the humanity of Jesus? Eh? Well, Jesus, but the two dimensions are clearly there in the Gospel. I think uh, our time is up. I've really gone eight minutes beyond my time, um, but it's, it's great to have you with us and to be able to, 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 exp to express what John's Gospel is all about. And I hope you get a, a deeper appreciation for the depth of what John's Gospel is trying to communicate. So if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to send them to Aaron, and I promise that I will answer them more quickly than I did Jonah's question. And please remember we're meeting next week, as Father mentioned, on Tuesday, not Wednesday. If you come on Wednesday, I certainly won't be here.